Hi everybody, my name is Barry Silverman. I'm one of the founders of uh, Visual6502.org. It's a website that basically uh, demonstrates the internal guts of a 6502 in a way that basically anybody can learn from and understand and appreciate uh, the design that was done back in 1974-75. And back in the early 70s, when all this began over there, telephones were a thing that you plugged into the wall. Computers lived in large classroom attended by dozens of acolytes. And games were something that were played on cardboard boards with dicey plastic pieces. Uh, go forward about 10 years from then, and we'll find that basically almost everybody, certainly in this room, would have had a computer in their house. Uh, that the telephones were largely become, starting to become mobile at the time, and games were something that almost every kid was playing on their NES any system or on their Atari system. So the thing that started that whole revolution was the invention of the, the single chip microprocessor, which basically happened in 1972. Uh, now, the 6502 wasn't unique among the other, other microprocessors. At the same time, there were uh, Motorola was developing the 6800, uh, uh, Intel was developing the 8008, Zyla was developing the uh, Z80, but the 6502 was the first single chip microprocessor that basically cost $25 when everything else cost $250. And, and in addition to that, it was also significantly faster and the instruction set was significantly more programmer friendly than anything any of the other microprocessors had done. Uh, the main reason being that uh, Chuck Peddle, the guy who was the leader of the design team that basically did that, was wanted to aim the microprocessor at more of the home market and the hobbyist market than any of the other, any of the other competitors, which were all going after like the large car companies or whatever, and small obscure companies with the names of Apple and Atari and Commodore basically all picked up the twenty-five dollar uh, chip over there, embedded in, in their uh, in their products, and the rest is basically history. So. Well, I guess watching some of the presentations I've seen this morning over there, many of you understand deep and dirty the guts of what your machines are looking like, but it all basically stops at that little chip in the middle, which is the 6502. Uh, largely the story of who did the 6502, how it was done, and what's actually inside it, and how they actually succeeded in basically making something that was faster and better in something that cost uh, between uh, a fifth and a tenth the price that any of the competitors would be doing it is a reasonable story and it hasn't been told very well. Uh, in addition to that, uh, MozTech, the original developer of the chip over there, has been through many ownership changes and a large amount of the original design material was basically gone. Uh, my brother and I both consider ourselves as digital archaeologists and as digital archaeologists, and that's a sort of a funny name, We've been basically uh, tasked ourselves with bringing back uh, significant old pieces of hardware and software back from the dead when they were logically extinct. Uh, but the 6502 itself is actually in reasonable shape, but the design material and how the thing actually worked is still shrouded in, in a complete mystery over there. And we believe that the, the results of our project here have really, really helped both uh, people that are interested in the history of the chip as well as people who are really, really interested in the internal guts of the chip. Uh, we provided them something and a means of studying the chip to a level of detail that we've ever done in the past. So, so the first thing I'll show is one of the original uh, digital archaeology projects that we did, which was to resurrect the, the PDP-1 space war. This was basically running on a machine at MIT designed by a bunch of people in 1962. This game was basically written on a, an assembly language and it ran in 2K. Now, I, I challenge anybody today using modern processors to design a game that's as playable with this in 2K. And where we found it basically in the early 90s was it went largely extinct in 1980 uh, when the last PDP-1 that was running in the Boston Computer Museum stopped working. Uh, what we managed to do was uh, find in the basement of one of the original inventors, basically an old paper tape that basically had the source code on it. We managed to convince somebody to read it into some human readable form, and we typed it into a computer and on this website over here, which is probably, you could Google Space War, it's probably the uh, first or the second, or maybe the third, depending on where Google search algorithms are on any given day. 
you'll be able to come to this website over here and you'll see that. Uh, since we did this development back in 1997, I'm annually getting calls from uh, basically television stations, radio stations, people looking to find the original, uh, original authors of the code. Uh, anytime Space War hits a significant anniversary, which next year is going to be its 50th, so I expect to be inundated with uh, calls on all sorts of things. But basically this was arguably, and I, I haven't seen any evidence to the contrary, this is the world's first video game. So the concept of basically bringing back the artifacts, not just as a, a description of what we were looking at back 10, 20 years ago, but to actually bring the artifact back to life, I think it's got a lot of value. And we think we've done the same thing with the 6502. Now, one of the other things that we've done was We've done about a dozen or so uh, software projects where we've taken what we consider significant uh, software, software elements and reproduced them. Unfortunately, uh, rights issues have kept us from putting it on the internet and basically uh, appealing to more than just the narrow audience that would basically understand that. We've done things like uh, APL 360, uh, uh, the uh, Xerox Alto. So Xerox Alto was the, uh, was the machine that was running at Xerox Park when Steve Jobs came by and was uh, inspired to do the Macintosh. And, uh, the research machine that he saw, he basically copied many of the design elements and managed to reproduce that. Uh, back about four or five years ago, uh, we got our first, ask, uh, first try at doing a hardware project, which was the Intel 4004. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the 4004, but it, it is the world's first uh, single chip microprocessor. The, uh, and the story of it is actually really, really funny because Intel at the time wasn't a processor company, Intel was making memories. And they had gotten, but they were also just doing some work on the side in the chip fab plan, uh, just to basically you know, earn some extra revenue. And one of the jobs that they took on was to build this calculator for a Japanese calculator company. Uh, and basically, they tasked two junior engineers, one guy from the Japanese company, and one guy from Intel, to basically uh, make this calculator over there. And basically, from then on, the rest of the top management of Intel totally ignored it. Uh, the guy from Japan basically decided <coughs> that the complexity of the calculator, rather than doing it as a complete uh, hardwired design, which is how all the calculators were done back then, uh, they decided to do it as, a, as a, a conventional computer, a binary computer, and then basically write the code that did the calculator in software. Now that was a completely brand new, totally strange idea for anybody to have back then. But these guys basically, being young and didn't know, they understand the the task that they were undertaking basically went off and they basically did it. Uh, a year and a half later, they basically came out with the 4004 with the project with huge amounts of drama and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but they succeeded, they put it in the calculator and at that point basically Intel uh, proceeded to almost forget about it. Uh, the two guys that were working at Intel at the time, a guy named Fred, Fred Enrico Fajin and uh, Shima Matesoshi, were basically, uh, were basically really, really pitching to the senior management at Intel over there, these, there's life in these processors, you're going, you're going to do something over there with these processors. And in, in the case of uh, Federico Fagin, he couldn't convince them that there was a real market there, so he went off and found another obscure company called Zilog, which then went off and made his fortune as, as a Silicon Valley millionaire doing something like that, whereas uh, you know, Shima basically stayed on with Intel, did the 8080, 8080, the 8080, and the 8086. Uh, for the 35th anniversary, <laughs> given that we've done a number, I was approached by <clears throat> Tim McNerney, whose name's there on the bottom over there, because <clears throat> we've done a number of simulations of uh, software in the past of these old, of these old artifacts. <clears throat> he asked my brother and I to basically see if we could do the same thing with the 4004 hardware. <clears throat> and this one was relatively easy because Intel was providing us all the material, so we basically got it. Uh, all the schematics for the 4004 and all the masks that were used to actually fabricate the chip. And from that we were able to basically develop a, a, an electrical simulator that basically allowed us to uh, totally run a 4004 plus the program that ran on the calculator just basically from, from the transistor level on. Uh, that's, th those simulations were actually used, then used by other members of our team to actually build a real 4004 replica out of real transistors rather than uh, just uh, 
just software, but it gave us the confidence at that point that we could actually do a real chip. And it basically broadcast both our capabilities and our name out onto the internet. So comes, uh, comes basically about two and a half years ago, uh, a guy named Greg James, who was, a, who was an engineer from California, basically says, hey, I'm really into photography and I, I, I like decathlon chips over there. Why don't we do what you did for the 4004, except we'll do it for the 6502. And Greg got a, it, it is uh, quite a wild man over there. He worked for NVIDIA for a long time, and NVIDIA, I believe, has got the capabilities to do reverse engineering of other people's chips. Uh, they had to be, basically take the plastic or the metal on top of it to etch them down and to look and take photographs of them. Uh, Craig basically absorbed a lot of the technology to do all of that, and, and, and I'll go into a little bit of detail about what exactly he did to the chips to actually uh, accomplish that. Now, the chips of that era, 1970s era going forward or, or over there, are all things that are very accessible to people, to individuals like ourselves. The modern chips are basically, you can't even take a picture with a microscope anymore. The, the, uh, the things are too fine and you, you have to use other technologies to resolve the, the fine distances between the lines on the chip. Uh, 4000, uh, 4004 had about 2,000 transistors in it. Uh, 6502 has about 4,000 transistors in it. And it's easily understandable by a single person. Uh, the team that developed the 6502 was largely two or three people that did the design and probably another four or five that basically did the layout, uh, which was done all completely mechanically and by hand on the, uh, on the die. Uh, they didn't have any computer tools. It, it, in fact, it took the microprocessors to develop electronic design tools that were people were then using to do all electronically. So everybody was basically working from hand-drawn schematics and basically uh, the, the drawings that were done for these were all pasted up using uh, basically large piece of acetate that was hung on the wall or hung on the floor and they would basically be taping various bits and wires on them over there and those would, people would then take photographs of them and then, then pass them through the chip fabrication process. So, so the 6502 yeah, it happened to be famous in that it ended up in the Apples, and ended up in the Commodores, and ended up in the Ataris, and in the, in, in the Nintendo NES systems over there. That chip, all by itself, basically meant that almost anything that ended up in the home and the programs by people like yourselves were using 6502. Now, uh, just to judge the, the technical, uh, how technical to make this presentation, uh, how many of you actually program, program the 6502? Okay, basic, okay, how many do that in assembly language? Okay, that's good. Uh, and how many of you know anything about how microprocessors work? I mean, good, so I can get very close. So, what, um, what Greg basically did is, and the motivation for why we're actually doing these things is, is while they people understand how the 6502 works really, really well. Understand the assembly language. I've spoken with people who can tell me uh, when there's a DMA in progress over there, how many cycles this instruction's gonna take rather than that instruction's gonna take. And what happens when a jump misses or whether a jump doesn't miss in terms of what's going on electrically on the CPU. Almost nobody knows except by poking at it from the outside how, the, how that was actually done. Uh, in our case, we were able to basically completely open up the top of the thing, run it in a way that you, you we have a, a simulation that basically even the designers of the chip didn't have, which is we can visually watch every instruction, every cycle work through the thing, and uh, examine every single signal that's going on inside the chip. And the idea is we're not trying to be able to build a better, a better emulator. Uh, there's hundreds of 6502 emulators out there, thousands of them over there, but all of them basically aren't 100% accurate. Uh, Many of the things, what we're doing is trying to basically preserve the design effort that was done back in, the seven, in 1974 by the original 6502 team so people can actually understand, reverse engineer, and look at basically, in my opinion, is a real piece of art. I mean, again, in 4,000 in 4, transistors, they managed to do, probably do on the same scale that the guys who did Space War did, which is 4,000 transistors do a complete CPU totally usable by hundreds of thousands of computer programs in the next, uh, in, in the subsequent 20, 30 years. And uh, 
done on a real shoestring budget by a team of about four or five people. So definitely one of the points of, of our effort was to basically publicize the name of the people who did some of the work and, and to, if they wanted it, their names to be made public and basically honor the fact and get people to really appreciate that this was something even if, if it's, oh, it's a 6502, it's a toy, and you look at a modern tele telephone, and what's going on in the ARM processors that run on modern telephones, uh, this is sort of a toy when they're talking two, five, between two and five million transistors. But uh, 4,000 transistors to have a working processor over there is, is quite a job. I and mean, even the, the competitors over there couldn't do it in, 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 on the same sort of die size at the same sort of problem. So Greg was the one that basically started it. He was the one that actually got to the point where he, uh, like I guess, to understand, understand how digital, this digital archaeology where the most important thing to get is bits. I mean, someone's got to give us the actual software or the bits of the things that we're trying to figure out how to work. What Greg had basically done is he basically took a chip, took off the top, basically, basically took photographs of everything that was there so we had uh, 120 to 120, 200 odd photographs of each individual ship. He basically converted what's over there into multiple layers and polygons, which he drew by hand. And from that, we used those polygons to basically assemble a transistor list of what's on it, and then basically went it through a CPU set, basically convert that transistor list through our electrical simulator and something that basically runs like a CPU set. It's a 100% accurate, accurately working version of the 6502 chip. In the, in the logical sense, it doesn't 100% accurately model the, some of the, the funny electronics that went over there when the 6502 was doing something erroneous. And in the 6502, there are a number of unassigned opcodes over there where basically they short together two wire, short together two wires inside the chip, and the results are uncertain. Well, we don't we don't emulate that. We do emulate everything that the designers intended. Yeah, so back when they designed those things over there, it's you, you can see that the number of transistors counts. I mean, we're talking about something that was done way down here. I mean, we're basically up in modern FPGAs uh, are, are way up over here. So to get something that's actually functional and usable, again, you're well aware of what you can actually do with these things over there. The 2,000 with 4,000 transistors is, is pretty good. Okay, those things, I, I'll repeat, these things were not designed by computer, they were designed by people writing uh, schematics, and then the schematics were then taken to a layout crew, which would then have to basically manually do what they're doing right there with a plotter and, uh, and uh, a plastic, uh, basically a knife. They were basically cutting out little bits of plastic over there, which they were gluing on a piece of acetate, and then taking photographs of to drive the, the, the chip fabrication. There was no optimizations, and Again, all done by hand. And again, if you do a detailed study of the die photographs that we've got and the simulation that you've got, you'll see a number of those cases. The part of the audience for what we did over here, and we've gotten a lot of feedback from, was a group called 6502.org. I don't know if you guys are familiar with them. But they've been poking, for the last 20 years, they've been poking around the own sites of the 6502s trying to figure out exactly how it worked. And the results of our the results of our effort over there has really, really made things uh, a lot simpler for them. So uh, Chuck Peedle basically the, the two guys, and I don't know if you know the name Chuck Peedle, he ended up going back moving into Commodore after when uh, Commodore bought Moscow. Uh, and uh, there's a, I guess the guy's name is yeah, Bill Nash, so the two people that basically are still actively talking about this. And there are a number of uh, there's a Chuck Peedle has done a number of like, interviews on the internet where you can get a really good story about what actually happened there. And what, the, what he's got a picture of there is the actual die sheet, uh, layout sheet that was then used to basically take photographs and drive the ship ship application. So we talked about the 4004. These were the schematics. So unlike the 4004, the 4004 we did from the schematics. So this is what Intel basically supplied us. And from that, we, got, we, we built a working simulator. I mean, uh, the essence of our simulator is basically uh, to take transistors and wires and basically build a network of how they work together, and then something that just simulates, in this case, NMOS. Uh, basically, and just NMOS, and basically, you, you basically make a fake memory and a fake clock, and you basically you, you clock the chip and you watch the wires, and the wires will be either higher or the wires will be low, and you'll be able to 
watch exactly what's going on in the chip cycle by cycle. Uh, the 4004 uh, was actually quite elaborate for what they actually had to do. I would say the 4004 was harder to understand than the 6502 was. Now, in the case of the 6502, and this is where we came with Greg, is that he started off with completely modeling the physical chip. And I don't know how many of you people are aware of how modern semiconductors or even older semiconductors which were done. But it's basically you're starting with a wafer of silicon, and then you're basically putting on one layer which they call substrate, another layer which they call polysilicon, and another layer where they call metal. So the, the, the transistors are basically made up of everywhere where, uh, where a piece of polysilicon crosses a, a piece of substrate. And it's essentially, you're taking a photograph of something, you're, you're essentially you're printing it on the, on, the, on the silicon, you're basically taking a photograph, you're putting a little insulator over it, you're taking another photograph, you're putting something else on top of it, and something else on top of it, you're making the sandwich, and then basically you cover it with a piece of plastic and then you're done. And that, just by printing, you're essentially printing a photograph, and then but that photograph actually is something active. We've done exactly the same thing, only in reverse, is that we're basically, from the chip itself, we're deriving the photographs, and from the photographs, we're deriving the bits, and from the bits, we're deriving the transistors, and from the transistors, we're deriving, we're deriving the signal. So, so Greg's process, the first thing he does is he takes the cap off, basically means squirting sulfuric acid on it, and basically getting the, uh, basically revealing the, the chip underneath. And again, he did it largely with, I wouldn't say with stuff he had at home, but with uh, not expensive lab equipment. I think the most, the hardest thing that he eventually ended up having to do, since we've done a number of chips since then, is basically developing a good set of microscopy and lighting conditions, such that the, you, you basically avoid, avoid visual aberrations when you're taking the photographs, and, and getting uh, accurate representations that you can easily stitch together. So uh, the next step over there, once you've got that, is to basically take photographs. Now the field of a photograph to get an actual dye shot over there is, takes about, uh, it'll be about uh, between 250 and 300 odd shots of each individual dye to basically make a good accurate picture of the whole dye. So that means you basically, basically are, are snapping your shot through the microscope, you're twiddling those little knobs over there in the X direction or the Y direction. You're hoping to hell that it doesn't get jiggled, and then basically you're taking the resulting photographs that you've got under various lighting conditions, and then you're going to basically, basically stitching, stitching them together into a single die, die shot in a process that looks like this. What we've done uh, subsequent to that is uh, we found another collaborator who was a real image management specialist, and they basically he's able to basically with a piece of software take the individual shots that we have and align them. Uh, align them mechanically with a piece of software rather than uh, doing it the way Greg did on the first one over there where he had to basically do it all by hand. And that's basically what the, the first die shot that he took and the first thing that, that he used to do that. That's basically the complete shot with all the layers on top of the ship. Actual 6502. I can actually describe what's on the thing. I'll show you the other layers that we have there. The things are actually done with two layers. Yeah. This is the second shot that he has to do. What he does is he takes that original chip and he basically etches off all the metal and all the polysilicon gets etched off over there. And he basically produces this, which is essentially the layer where all the transistors are. But this is essentially is a, like a roadmap of what's really on the chip. The metal basically is, is, are basically wires connecting things going up and down over there. So the, the metal is really obscuring a lot of features on this chip. Whereas the, some of the other layers, the polysilicon layers over there, there are channels here that are very visible. Now, Greg made an original attempt at basically automatically drawing the polygons. See, the problem with the photographs is the photographs represent multiple layers on the same sort of chip. And you have to, in order for us to do a proper simulation, we really need basically to have clean ver versions of each layer, plus there's some, uh, they call them vias, basically little pieces, little bits of wire that connect the layers together. So in order to make an electrically accurate simulation, we basically need to know 
we need to basically take a photograph and then isolate, uh, isolate all the things that we're seeing, all the visual artifacts that we're seeing into multiple layers. And uh, we tried an automated procedure up at the front, but we really couldn't get it to work. And we're, Greg basically said, hey, well, hell, there's only 3,000, 4,000 odd transistors on this thing. I'm going to do it by hand. So we basically developed a piece of Python software that basically took these photographs and basically he was just drawing individual polygons on top of the photographs to map what's going over there. And we ended up <coughs> with something that looked like... So this is basically a complete physical representation of what's in the 6502 derived from the photographs. Uh, each of these colors are, are actually on the image here, are, are kept in physically distinct layers that are on the, that are on the uh, chip itself, sort of in the image itself. So we can basically isolate uh, uh, at any point in time in software which <coughs> things that we're looking at. Uh, we see these little yellow holes, those are what we call the vias, that's where basically a layer of metal is attached to a layer of polysilicon or a layer of substrate. So from this, basically, we have a complete, an act, totally accurate model of the physical chip. I mean, we've got all the layers, we've got all the interconnections from the layers, but we don't have uh, what's on a schematic. We don't have transistors, we don't have wires. Uh, the next piece of thing, this is where Brian and I got involved in, is we took uh, Greg's data structure that he had over here that represented all these images over there, and we used that to crunch. Uh, first, we simplified the, what we call here the physical model into something called a logical model. And a logical model means that if a wire basically starts here, basically goes through a via, goes underneath, comes back up again, goes over there, that's like eight objects in Greg's structure. In our structure, it's one, and it represents a wire. Uh, we also derived where all the transistors were because in the uh, the rules that I've designed at the time over there, transistors don't overlap. So it would be very easy for us to basically derive from here, basically the list of every transistor and everything that's wired for it. We re basically removed everything that related to uh, power and ground wiring since they just obscure what the thing looks like. And then we uh, basically ran it through the electrical simulator we've done through the 4004. And uh, it, it totally surprised us, but it largely worked. There were uh, in, in the case that we had for, with Greg, uh, basically we found zero wiring errors in the thing that he did, which considering he has 20,000 odd individual polygons here over there, that is just totally amazing and I'm still shaking my head over that. Uh, in terms of our uh, electrical simulator working, there were only uh, two <coughs> artifacts of things that, the, that, that, were, that we didn't include in the 4004 that were necessary to, to include to make it work in the 6502. <coughs> So the model that we ended up with is something that looks like this. Okay, I'll give you, give you, this, give you the whole chip. So this is the view that we've got over here in Visual 6502. It's available on the internet, www.visual6502.org. And what that represents is a logical description of every wire and every transistor that's on the chip. Uh, beside it, we've got basically a little program you can type in on the side. Sorry, the mouse, my mouse isn't working out here. So we can type in a program onto the on, onto the mouse. You can basically zoom the chip. You can look at if you want any individual wire. You can basically say, "What's the name of this wire here?" Select it. It says. That's Y0, which it basically means it's bit zero of the Y register. Uh, or this one over this bit over here, that's the X register. It's bit zero of the X register. Uh, you could cycle the, you could then cycle the instructions forward, basically, and it basically is going to show you for every clock cycle what's actually happening on the chip. It's going to make it better like Actually, just plug and just get it to run, and that's basically what that is doing. I mean, it's not very clear over here, but what it's basically doing is it's cycling through this program over here. That little yellow box is where the, basically the uh, data bus is, and what data is getting, which reading or writing from the data bus. And 
that's running down and it's basically cycling every single wire in the chip. Now, uh, we've actually used it to debug. We've managed to find just three or four bugs that are well known in the 6502. We've basically isolated versions of the chip that have them and been able to figure them out. We've also uh, used it. Uh, there's a number of other people who have collaborated since we've done this uh, that have really seriously reverse engineered the chip. And basically, we have names for virtually every signal that's going on inside the chip at the moment as well. The, um, it's possible while it's running, for instance, to zoom it up, though it's not so fast. This thing, the, this Visual 6, this is a really good exercise for your browser over here, the, the drawing on it over here. We, found that we find that uh, this thing is running probably, when it's visualizing over here, probably one ten thousandth the speed of the real chip. Uh, if we turn off the display, and most of the work is actually drawing the polygons on the screen. If we turn that off, it probably goes down to about one five hundred of the speed of a real chip. Uh, there have been a number of people that basically, since we revealed the Visual 6502, we shared our net list, which is a list of transistors and wires with a number of other collaborators, and they've written C++ versions of the emulator, they've done, uh, somebody's done an FPGA implementation of it that basically they're able to actually run our net list inside an FPGA that they plugged inside an Atari and actually had it run uh, on the thing that Atari ROM. So it's quite a, it's, it's accurate and the, the, one of the, the, the things that have really surprised me about what it does is, are, are, are two things. One is that the, the net list that we've got shares absolutely nothing with what the original design was other than uh, an actual structure. We have a very, very abstract version of a 6502 and yet it's been implemented uh, half a dozen times already right now in other people's emulators with exactly the same results, and it, which is the same as a real object. So we managed to abstract out uh, a, a very platonic version of what a, a 6502 is that's completely uh, devoid of uh, semiconductor physics, uh, computer language, uh, machine that it's running on over there and still operates like a 6502. Uh, the second thing that was really surprising about us is uh, like this was the first project where we actually went from photographs right into a working emulator. Uh, it, it, was, it, it really, but when, when we first got the first program running on this, it was, it was always as if somebody had drawn, drawn a picture of a butterfly on a sheet of paper, uh, give it a little electric shock, and it flew away. It's really, I mean, what you're seeing here is something that behaves just like the real chip, acts like the real chip, and when we implement exactly the same algorithm into a piece of silicon, it's just like just like the real chip as well. So it's really the gets you know, it's really about bringing a piece of artifact back and having really captured it. And, and, and I think that uh, I think that we really have. Uh, for further work, I mean, I don't know if anybody's really interested in, in getting a better description of what's going on inside the 6502. I can certainly I, I can certainly do that if anybody's really interested. Because I'm, I'm sure you've seen, I'm sure you people have seen the die shots, but and I'm like, like since we started here, like one of the goals that I really had here is to actually learn how that chip really worked. I mean, when I started, I really didn't know very much about how microprocessors work. And I, and I, and I learned a lot. I mean, again, my, my, uh, I'd been working for a large computer company in the past, and basically when they did, a, they did a CPU, it was done on 7, 10, 20 boards, and to have something abstracted into something this small was, was uh, quite amazing. Uh, I don't know, is anybody really interested in how this thing really lays out, where your favorite pictures are on the chip? Yes. Uh, data is a long way, basically D0 to D0 to D7. Address bus is along here. That's the Y register, that's the X register, that's the stack. Right over here is the uh, arithmetic logical unit, basically does adds to subtract. It does adds and subtracts uh, and shifts. Basically this is the digital adjustment. 
output. So when the ALU produces a binary number over there, it runs it through this set of gates over there, makes them into, into decimal numbers, so we get some adjustment. Accumulators right over here. So this is accumulator. Basically, uh, PC low, PC high, and that's the PC, that's the PC uh, <coughs> indexer, so that's the PC increment over here. Basically, this is basically the bus that basically, there's a couple of buses that go from here right on to the data bus. This is the data bus going up, and the data bus coming down. These big things over here are really large because they have to condition signals coming in from the outside. Uh, basically, when an instruction comes in, it works its way up this way over here through a decoder network. This is sort of a ROM that basically decodes the instructions and it runs through a real mess of logic here. And this is really messy. This thing isn't systematic at all. And I think they, that they did a number of design shrinks on these things that made it even worse than it already was. But basically, by the time it comes up the bottom here, these are all signals that basically control these networks. So there'll be a signal here to basically uh, put the results of Y on the bus, or put the results of X on the bus. There'll be a signal to basically take the take what's on the bus over here and, and put it into X. There'll be things, something here to basically enable the stack register, basically when you're doing a push or a pop, to basically enable the stack re register to put something in them. Um, the results of the ALU. The thing, um, one of the things that was really, really unique about the 6502 at the time is that, is that would overlap uh, instructions. Uh, uh, basically, that, that would mean that uh, while, it, while, it, while it was executing one instruction over there, it would be busy fetching the opcode for the next one. So we would be doing all sorts of uh, interesting things like that, and all the logic is encoded in there. And uh, there used to be large flame, uh, flame wars on the various 6502 sites about how it was actually done. And we believe we've resolved a lot of that, because if anybody really wants to know how to do it, they would basically put in a, a small test program to do it, and then just watch what the chip itself did. Uh, it, it also executes about 98% of the uh, unassigned opcodes, exactly like the test programs that people have done. And the 2% the that don't do it, do it because the, uh, the system is doing something electrically uh, not, uh, not correct, and the, the results are indeterminate. Now, uh, Chuck Peel on his uh, on the website basically said that the reason they did that is they did a number of design shrinks, because in order for them to meet that uh, twenty-five dollar price tag, it had to fit the die had to fit within a certain size, and that means they had to they, they repeatedly try to make this thing because they kept pouring more and more logic onto it, it kept growing and they had to shrink it. And one of the things that they had to do to, to make it work is they had to remove all the logic that would reject un unacceptable outcomes. So there's all sorts of, uh, it's possible in many cases here if you do the wrong thing, to, to have the thing do something really incorrect. And in some cases over there in the earlier chips, the, those incorrect things could have put the processor, just basically reset the processor and put it into a loop. And it was fixed in one it's been a, I mean, a real journey for us in that uh, we think we've got something here that, we, that anybody that wants to analyze in as gory details they care to how the ship works and what it's up, up, up against. Uh, there's also, uh, if you're a historian or interested in the history of it, all sorts of artifacts in here of signals that run out to nowhere. Uh, basically, there, if you go searching through these things, a number of people have identified uh, places where where an obvious edit was made or an obvious edit was made and cancelled. It's it's a real um, uh, as in real archaeology. There are all sorts of interesting artifacts in here that you think can be used for further study. Uh, I'm pretty sure that people have also used this. Uh, we're starting to see them in computer science courses as well now. That a number of computer science courses have now have uh, Udicial 65 or two on the syllabus, which I think is a good thing. The, the nature of modern computers are that, is that they're very opaque to people. I mean, you, you people come from the generation where I mean, you're very close to the metal, and modern computers aren't close to the metal at all. Uh, what we've done with this is even when you were close to the metal, you weren't particularly close to this, and this is as close to the metal as like you'd like to see in a silicon day, in a, in a, in a silicon uh, that you would see anywhere else. And I myself learned a lot about silicon and silicon processes and how the whole thing worked. And it turns out it's not that complicated when you're looking at something like this. So that's more or less what I have to say. Is there any, any questions?
questions? Yeah. yeah. What chip are you going to tackle next? Uh, that's a good question. It really depends on what we've got, but what we get bits for. I mean, there's the, as a result of this thing, we, we collected a whole pile of chips that we basically decapped and taken photographs on. If I really wanted to do something, I really would like to have some somebody that could help us find a way to automatically draw those polygons. Those are like. To actually process a chip these days, it takes about a day to basically decap it and clean it. It takes about another two or three days to photograph it, and it takes anywhere from three to four months to basically draw the polygons accurately. Uh, there have been two approaches that we've done so far. One is an image processing sort of approach. <coughs> and so far, we haven't found anything that sort of works doing the obvious things. I mean, there might be some tricks we can do with chemistry and basically have the uh, have various elements basically come out in different colors or in, uh, in different spectra or something or bombarding into something that's not light or different filtered light but that hasn't has yet not done anything useful and the other one was trying to crowdsource it uh, where, where we basically give small rectangles of the chip to of the chip we're looking at to somebody else uh, to, to a bunch of people and see if they can draw them and then we can glue them all together but that one basically we started that but, uh, it lost a lot of steam because uh, it's actually hard to administer something like that. It requires a lot of uh, a, a lot of on-hand management by people to just keep all the crowdsourcing stuff and glue it together on an automated basis. Uh, there is uh, we are actively working on an SID chip. I mean, there's somebody that's out there. There's uh, one guy that's probably three quarters of the way through doing the polygons through an SID chip. For the 85A? Yeah, the 85A. Uh, the uh, only uh, trouble with it is a lot of analog on that chip over there, so our simulator probably uh, isn't quite up to snuff on it, but like once he's got the polygons over there, I'm looking forward to see if we can emulate, uh, emulate basically the uh, digital, uh, basically the digital amplifiers and some of the analog circuitry that's on it. Of a comment. It's not a very practical idea, but it, it sort of makes me with all that mess of circuitry and all of the design considerations that they had trying to make the CPU to a price point. It would be a fun project if practical to redesign it today to be as efficient as possible and yet do what it does. It would be very interesting to see just how much better a CPU it might be. Well, like the skill of actually drawing raw silicon like that is also evaporating. And most uh, silicon engineers these days are using silicon compilers, large image libraries, and then we, we it was implemented. We did implement a 6502 you know, on an FPGA using yeah using this, and that that FPGA implementation. Well, the one that basically emulated this exactly was done uh, on like on a two hundred dollar FPGA, yeah. with like something like a hundred million transistors on it versus the four yeah. four thousand that's there. I mean, I think the skills of actually it's like people writing an assembler language. There's not a lot of people that, that hand to in silicon anymore. There's like not a lot of people that, that, that hand to computers. But again, our uh, our motivation is to basically display how well that's done. And if anybody wants to go to an arbitrary level of detail to understand how it was done in the past, it was definitely a significant amount of work. It definitely had significant. Uh, implications by the fact that they did do that and they did make it to the price point. Uh, it did have a big impact on the world. And largely the people don't really know the names of the people who did it or how it was done. Whereas people know Steve Jobs and people know uh, Steve Jobs and Wozniak are, are famous names, whereas I think this is just as significant and nobody knows. Thank you very much.